Hello, I'm Michelle Crummel, and in this lesson, we're going to see how to find the volume of a solid with cross sections of a known shape. Let's consider this first scenario. So we have this three dimensional solid figure, and if we were to take cross sections perpendicular to the x axis, then we see that the cross sections have a parabolic shape to them and it, they have a little bit of thickness so our slice is going to have a little bit of thickness to it and that is what is indicated in the figure here by this delta x that's the thickness here of that slice so we want to write an expression for the volume of one of these slices Well, the volume would just be the area of the face times the thickness. And we're told here, we don't know exactly what the area is equal to, but we're told that A of X sub K represents the area at a certain X value, the area of that cross section. So we have to imagine looking at it from the side, looking at it from a side view. Okay, so the volume would just be the a of x sub k, that's the area function, the area of the cross section, times the thickness, delta x. And if we want to do this multiple times and take multiple cross sections, we're going to have a bunch of these slices here, and we would add them up starting at x equals a, stopping when we get to x equals b. So we're going to use a definite integral to set this up. It's going to be the integral from x equals a to x equals b of the area, and I'm just going to say a of x here in general, times dx. And that is going to give us the volume of this solid. Suppose we have a region r. It is in the first quadrant. It's enclosed by the graphs of y equals 2x and y equals x squared. And this region R is the base of a solid. Each cross section perpendicular to the x axis has an area given by this area function sine of pi over 2 times x. Find the volume of the solid. So I'm just going to roughly sketch my graph. It doesn't need to be perfect, but we've got y equals x squared. And remember that we're just in quadrant one, so I'm only going to draw the right side of that parabola. And then we also have y equals 2x, y equals 2x, again, just in quadrant one. So something that looks like this. And we'll label those y equals x squared, y equals 2 times x. And then the this enclosed region here, so I'm going to shade it. This enclosed region is the base of a solid. So we have to imagine that we're looking down on this for a top-down view. This is the bottom of it. Imagine that the screen is a table and this is the base of our solid. Our solid is sitting on this table. So I'm gonna to wanna to find the point of intersection for these two functions. So they intersect here at zero, zero. And then if we were to set x squared equal to two x, we can subtract the 2x on both sides, factor out an x. We get x equals either 0 or 2. So here, this point of intersection occurs at an x value of 2, a y value of 4. So that's going to establish the interval that I'm working on. Cross sections are perpendicular to the x axis, so the cross sections look like this. It's a dx problem. So when I set up my volume, I'm going to integrate from x equals 0 to x equals 2. That's the interval that we're working on here. And then it's pretty difficult to draw the part that is um, three dimensional, the part that's coming up off the base towards you. But we do know that the area of these cross sections are the sine of pi over 2x. So we're going to integrate our area function times dx. So the sine of pi over 2x dx. 
and that is our setup here. Now, if we're gonna do this integral by hand, then we would be using u substitution. We would let u equal pi over two x, our du dx equals pi over two. So I have two over pi times du equals dx, and I can substitute that right in for the dx here. So we'll be integrating, now it's a u substitution, so my bounds will need to change. They're not gonna go from zero to two. I'm gonna use this equation here to change my bounds. So my volume would be the integral from u equals. When x equals zero, if we substitute zero into this equation for x, we get u equals zero. When x equals two, if I substitute two in for x, I get u equals pi for my upper bound and then the sign of u, and the dx gets replaced with du times two over pi, and the two over pi is a constant multiple, so I'm gonna bring that out front. So then I have two over pi. I'm gonna go ahead and find the antiderivative of sine of u. The derivative of cosine is negative sine, so I know this is gonna be negative cosine u from zero to pi and then we evaluate, so two over pi, negative cosine of pi, the cosine of pi is negative one, so I have negative negative one minus, and then the cosine of zero is one, so I have minus a negative one here, and so we have two over pi times one plus one, or four over pi for our final answer. So I think it does really help with these problems if you can visualize what the solid looks like. So here are three really great demonstrations and they're interactive. So if you go to these sites, you'll be able to use the sliders, move the figure around, look at it from different angles, different perspectives, and kind of get a sense of what these solid figures look like. Let's go ahead and visit demo number one. In this interactive demo, we have some check boxes that we can use and some sliders that we can move around. We also have on the right a graph that we can move using your mouse or I'm using my trackpad to look at this figure from different angles. So if we were to look at it as if we had drawn it on our paper, then it would look something like this, where this red axis is representing the x-axis, our horizontal axis, the green axis is the y-axis, and that's the one that's vertical. And then we also, it's, it's hard to see it at the moment because we are looking at a top-down view here, but there is a third axis, the blue axis, that is kind of popping out towards us. If we're looking at it like this, it would be popping out towards us, but I can rotate the view and make it look a little bit different here. So now it looks like the Z axis is the vertical one. So on our paper, when we set up our problems like this, we draw the base of our solid. And in this case, the base of our solid is represented by this region between this red function and this blue function. So not exactly sure what the functions are. It looks like the blue one might be y equals x squared and the red one might be y equals square root of x. And we have in purple there drawn a reference rectangle or a slice. That would That is supposed to represent a cross section. If we make a vertical slice down the solid perpendicular to the x-axis, and this is the way we would draw it on our paper. So how is this three-dimensional? Um, when I rotate it, it doesn't look very three-dimensional, right? So I need to turn on one of our checkboxes, and I'm gonna start by turning on the checkbox that says square. So now we see, okay, there's a bunch of rectangles drawn, and that is the number that we see there is based on this slider value. So I'm gonna take it all the way down to one because normally on our paper, we just draw one reference rectangle. But now that I've checked that box that says square, there's something different now. It's hard to see again because we're looking at a top down view, but there is something coming up off the page towards us. So I'm gonna rotate the view so we can see that. 
it's coming up off the page towards us in the shape of a square because I checked that box that said square. So here's what we draw on our paper and we have to imagine that there is this square coming up off the paper right towards us and if we kind of rotate our view and look at it from this side that's when we're able to see the square. Now this is just you know one little cross section and because it has a little bit of thickness to it we can talk about it as a three-dimensional figure and calculate its volume but this is just one of our reference rectangles so I'm going to increase the slider the n value from 1 to let's bump it up to here it's 11 and then when I look at at this view I see that I have a bunch of squares all kind of stacked up next to each other well really to get the volume of the entire solid we want to have infinitely many squares so let's take that slider and bump it up even more let me go back to this top down view and the slider is set to go up to a maximum value of 100 but theoretically we want n to be infinitely large and so you can see but even with a hundred it's going to be good for our visualization they're so close together that it almost looks solid and now when I rotate the figure I can get a sense of what this three-dimensional object looks like Now the other slider on the bottom I haven't messed with, but that is going to be where our interval ends. So let me reduce n a little bit here so it's easier to see what's going on. Um, by default, it's got x equals 0.48. Maybe I want to go all the way over to x equals 1. And that just defines the interval that we're working on. Now we're working from 0 to 1. And when we rotate this here, we can see all of our squares. Notice that some of the squares, like on the far right side of the interval, are really tiny and the ones towards the middle are large. Well, why does that happen? Why are the squares all different sizes? It's because the side of the square or the base of the square is determined by this vertical distance between our two functions, f and g. So we could say f of x minus g of x represents the length of the side of the square. So when f and g are really close together, that square is going to have a small side length and when they're further apart the square is going to have a longer side length. So let's now change from square to equilateral triangle and you can see that it's a similar idea here it's just the shape is changing. Instead of having cross sections in the shape of squares now we have cross sections in the shape of triangles and if I want to visualize the solid I'm going to bump the value of n up as high as it'll go here to 100 and now we have this three-dimensional shape. So imagine that it's solid and our goal is to find the volume of this solid. So we need to find the volume of each one of these cross-sectional triangular prisms, right? They have a little bit of thickness to it so we can talk about it as being a triangular prism here. And we can use other shapes as well. Our last checkbox here is semicircles. Same idea, but now these cross sections are all semicircles. Notice that the base of the object is flat. So again, when we draw it on our paper, it looks like this. Top down view, we're seeing the bottom, the base, but we have to just imagine the part that is coming up off the page towards us. All right, so let's go back to calculating the volume of some of these practice problems. So in our figure here, it has been rotated to give us a better sense of what the three-dimensional solid looks like. Uh, but to help us set up the problem, I am going to redraw it just using a top-down view. So we've got 4 minus x squared. That's a parabola opening down. It's been shifted up 4. So it looks something like that, um, a little bit crooked, but it's a, it'll do. And I'm going to shade the base then of our solid. So that would be this region here. And then if we find the x-intercepts for y equals 4 minus x squared, the x-intercepts are at 2 and negative 2. So here's negative 2 
and here's positive 2. That's the interval that we're going to be working on. The cross sections are perpendicular to the x-axis, so I'm going to draw just one reference rectangle here. Now I know it's a dx problem. And then we have our squares coming up off the page. So it's a little challenging to, to draw it in such a way that it, it looks, you know, 3D. But there we go. There are our squares, and I'm just going to shade the side of the square here in a different color. Okay, so we want to find the volume of all of these squares that we could draw on our interval from negative 2 to 2. And to do that, we're going to set up our integral. But first, let's think about what the area of one of these squares would be, the area of the cross section here. It is a square, and the base of the square is just this vertical distance right here. And that vertical distance, remember for vertical distance, you do the top y minus the bottom y, and the top of this rectangle is touching our function y equals 4 minus x squared, and the bottom is just touching the y equals 0. So if we call this, if we were to call this function f of x, then the um, side of the square is just f of x. So the area of the square would be f of x squared, f of x squared. That's the area, the part that I shaded in green. And then we're going to multiply that by our dx to get the volume of one of these square prisms or rectangular prisms. So f of x gets squared and then multiplied by dx, the little width there. So to get the volume of the entire solid, we're going to integrate f of x squared dx from x equals negative 2 to x equals positive 2. So negative 2 to 2, and then our function f of x is 4 minus x squared. We're going to square that and then multiply it by dx. Now if we were doing the integral by hand, we would expand this, foil it out, use the power rule to integrate each term, and then evaluate. But I'd rather focus on getting the integrals set up correctly. But this one turns out to be 512 over 15. And you can verify that using Math 9 on your calculator if you have a TI-84. For this next problem, we're going to find the volume of the solid whose base is the region between the x-axis and the curve y equals 4 minus x squared. So the same base that we saw in the last problem. But this time, the cross sections perpendicular to the x-axis are equilateral triangles, not squares. They're equilateral triangles with a side on the base. So let's sketch our picture, top-down view. So we have our parabola here. That's our y equals uh, 4 minus x squared. And I'm going to draw one of these reference rectangles. On my diagram here, we know this went from negative 2 to positive 2. It's a vertical rectangle, so that means we're setting up a dx problem. And if I want to go ahead and try and draw these triangles, it is, it's difficult to do, um, you know, to make it look three-dimensional, but I'll just do my best here. Something like that, where this is kind of the, showing the thickness of the triangle, and then I'm going to shade the face of the triangle in green here. So we want to find something that represents the area. When we looked at the square, it was just side squared, or that base squared. So here we need the area for an equilateral triangle. Well, the side length of our equilateral triangle is this distance right here, which is just our function f of x minus 0, or just f of x. But I'm just going to refer to it as s, just to make the notation a little bit easier when I'm working through this. But we know that s 
is our function, the 4 minus x squared. The area of our triangle is going to be 1 half times the base of the triangle, which is the s, times the height of the triangle. So now that's the question. What is the height of this triangle right here? So let me draw this triangle from a different um, perspective. So pretend that's an equilateral triangle. We know that if we uh, drop a perpendicular down from this vertex at the top, it's going to bisect the angle at the top. So this becomes a 60 degree, 30 degree, 90 degree triangle right there. And we said that this whole length right here was S. And so if I just want to find now the area of one of these um, smaller triangles, the 30, 60, 90 triangles, that base length is going to be S over 2. It's half of S. Okay, so now what my ultimate goal here is to find the height of this triangle. Like this is what I'm looking for. What is the height of that triangle there? Well, that's the long leg of this 30, 60, 90 degree triangle. And this leg right here is S, and I know that because all three, uh, or not leg, but hypotenuse, is S because all three sides of the larger equilateral triangle have a length of S. So now we can use the Pythagorean theorem to figure out the long leg in that 30, 60, 90 triangle. Or you might know your ratios because this is one of our special right triangles. And you might remember that the ratio is 1 to square root of 3 from short leg to hypotenuse to long leg. So the long leg is the square root of 3 times the short leg. So square root of 3 times the length of that short leg. And if you don't have that uh, ratio memorized, again, you can use the Pythagorean theorem to get that. So the height of the triangle is square root of 3, s over 2. So my area function, if we simplify that, we've got an s times an s. It's going to give us s squared. We have a square root of 3 in the numerator. We have 2 times 2, or 4 in the denominator. So the area of that triangle in terms of s is square root of 3 over 4, s squared and we know that s equals 4 minus x squared. So putting this all together now, our volume is equal to the integral from negative 2 to 2, root 3 over 4, and the root 3 over 4 is a constant multiple, so you can move it outside of your integral, root 3 over 4 times s squared dx, and the s is the 4 minus x squared. So there's our setup for the volume. And if you compare this to the integral we used for the square, it's the same integral except this one is multiplied by root 3 over 4. So we could take the answer that we got for the volume when the cross sections were squares and just multiply that answer by root 3 over 4. So 512 over 15 times the root 3 over 4 is going to give us our volume here. Next, we have a similar problem. It's still the same um, base for our solid, but now the cross sections perpendicular to the x-axis are isosceles right triangles with one of their legs on the base. So I'm going to draw another sketch to help me set this up. We're going from negative 2 to 2. And now, so let's go over to the, the colored picture, and I'll just show you where that right angle is for that isosceles right triangle. There's the right angle there at the, at the bottom here. These are the right angles. And so this is the hypotenuse here. Okay, so when I draw this, I need one side to be coming up straight. I'll just try and do it like that, and then the same distance, right? Because in an isosceles right triangle, the legs are equal, but perspective is gonna play a trick on our eye here. Okay, so now our picture looks something like that. Here's the face of the isosceles right triangle, and then we've got you know a little bit of, of thickness there. Okay, so the side 
of the triangle is what I'm referring to as s here. And again, that's just our function. It's f of x minus 0, or the 4 minus x squared. So we want to write an expression for the area of this isosceles right triangle. Well, the isosceles right triangle is a 45, 45, 90 degree triangle. I'm just drawing it from a different viewpoint here. It's a 45, 45, 90 degree triangle. It's also exactly one half of a square. Exactly one half of a square. And we know that the area of the square is s squared. So the area of our triangle here is just one half s squared. So it's one half s squared, which is one half times four minus x squared. And setting up our volume then, we're going to integrate from negative two to two the area function times dx. The one half is a constant multiple, so we can bring that to the outside. You don't have to, but we can. Uh, oh, and I forgot to square my s right there, one half s squared. Okay, so four minus x squared squared dx. That's our setup for our volume equation. And the integral here is the same integral we used with our square. So our answer is just going to be half of the answer we got when our cross sections were squares. And I think that was, what, 5, 12 over 15? So our volume this time is going to be 5, 12 over 30. And in this next example, again, working with that same base but now our cross sections are semicircles. Oh, that was really not symmetric. Okay, so we're going from negative two to two. Here's my little reference rectangle, but now these are coming up off the page in the shape of a semicircle. So here's the face of the semicircle, and then we know it does have this you know, bit of thickness to it coming up like so. So the side, I'm going to call this right here again S. And in this case, it's really representing the diameter of this semicircle. But just to be consistent, I'll still refer to it as S. So we've got our length S equals 4 minus x squared. It's still just the top minus bottom to get vertical distance. So the top is touching, the top of the rectangle is touching um, the y equals 4 minus x squared, and the bottom of the rectangle is touching the y equals 0. So 4 minus x squared minus 0 is 4 minus x squared. That is that vertical distance there. And then the area of our semicircle is 1 half the area of the whole circle. And the whole circle is pi times the radius squared. Well, what is the radius of the semicircle? The diameter is s. So the radius is just half of the diameter. It's half of s, or s over 2, like so. So if we simplify that, we get 1 half times pi times s squared over 4, which becomes pi over 8 times s squared. So our volume is going to be the integral from negative 2 to 2 pi over 8, which is a constant multiple, so we can bring it to the outside of the integral, times s squared. And the s is the 4 minus x squared. Squared times dx. So again, this is just the integral that we used for square cross sections multiplied by pi over 8. So I know my answer is going to be pi over 8 times 5 12 over 15. In this next section, it's a little bit more complex because we do have two functions that are defining the base of our region. We've got x squared and 4x minus x squared. So you can see from the picture that's given what that looks like, but I'm just going to redraw it from a top-down perspective. So we've got one function that looks something like that, and then we have that's our uh, 4x minus x squared. Or you know what, I'll just label that g of x. It'll be easier. That's the g of x. And then we have, I'll switch colors, the other function coming up like so. And we've got this point of intersection right here. So here's my f of x function. Okay, so the base of our region 
is this region in between these two curves. And then if we take a cross section perpendicular to the x-axis, it's going to look like that. It's a vertical cross section. So this is, we're setting up a dx problem here, dx. And then the shape coming up off the page of these cross sections is square. So we've got squares coming up. It's getting a little messy here. Squares. And I'll shade um, the face of my square there in green. Okay, so we've got now the side equal to, and that's this vertical distance right here. But now it's not just the function. It's this vertical distance is g of x minus f of x. The top of the rectangle is touching y equals g of x. The bottom of the rectangle is touching y equals f of x. So that vertical distance, top minus bottom, is g of x minus f of x. Now what's the area of the square? Well, the area of the square is just s times s. Right? If this is s right here, then the area of the square is just s squared, which is g of x minus f of x, all squared. They're not individually squared. It's all squared. The difference is squared. That's my area function. So my integral and we didn't get our points of intersection yet, so we need to do that. This one is 0, 0 right here, but we need to find this other point of intersection. So let's just come off to the left-hand side over here and see where x squared equals 4x minus x squared. Add the x squared to both sides. You get 2x squared equals 4x. Subtract the 4x. 2x squared minus 4x equals 0 factor out a 2x, and we have x equals 0 and x equals 2. So this point right here is 2 comma 4, 2 comma 4. Which means our inter integral is going to go from x equals 0 to x equals 2. And then we're integrating the area function times dx. So g of x minus f of x squared dx. And no constant multiple for this one because it is just a square. And that turns out to be 64 over 15. For this next problem, same base as the last problem, but now the cross sections are equilateral triangles. So our area function we saw before in general because we found the area of the equilateral triangle in terms of s just the side length it was square root of 3 over 4 times the side length squared so I can go straight to my setup now we already found the points of intersection in the last problem they were 0 and 2 and so now we have root 3 over 4 times s squared. And remember our s in this case was top function minus bottom function, so it was g of x minus f of x. So g of x minus f of x all squared times dx. So that's going to turn out to be root 3 over 4 times the answer we got when we integrated g minus f squared from 0 to 2, which was 64 over 15. And here with our semicircles, again, as we saw before, it's going to be pi over 8 times the integral we would have set up if it had been a square. So f of, no, g of x was the top function. g of x minus f of x, all squared, times dx. So pi over 8 times 64 over 15. And let's wrap up with this last problem. Now this one does have different functions defining the base. So we want to think about this one. We're also not starting out with a graph provided. 
So let's do our best to sketch this. It is a calculator active question, so we can use the calculator to help. The x squared minus one is a parabola opening up. It's shifted down one, so that's gonna look like that, where that point right there is a one. Um, it doesn't say quadrant one, so let me go ahead and draw the other side over here. That's gonna be at negative one. Then for my x plus one, so that's a linear function, slope of one, it's been shifted up one. So we'll have put one right there, and then that's gonna look like so. Okay, so my region is going to be, let's shade that, uh, this region right in here. and we want our points of intersection. So it looks like it's negative one and then another value that's bigger than one. Let's go ahead and find the point of intersection. And again, this is a calculator active question, so you can do it on your calculator, uh, but it probably will be easy enough to do by hand. Maybe, we'll see. X squared minus X minus two equals zero. And that looks like it is factorable. X minus two times X plus one zero so we have negative one and then positive two so this is two comma three and this one is negative one comma zero cross sections perpendicular to the x-axis okay so it's a dx problem dx perpendicular to the x-axis are quarter circles okay so we haven't seen this shape before quarter circles I'll do my best to sketch it. Um, now, it, did, it didn't really specify that the radius of the circle was this base here, but um, I can't think of another way to interpret that, so we're gonna head, go ahead and go with that, as if um, this rectangle is really along the radius. So we will be coming up the same kind of distance for the radius and then around in an arc because this is now a quarter circle. I don't know how to draw the edge here to make it look right. That is coming up in the shape of a quarter circle. So let's just shade our quarter circle face in green here. And we're going to call this distance S. Okay, so let's define S. S, it's gonna be the top Y minus the bottom Y. This is vertical distance. So the top Y is the Y equals X plus one. So X plus one minus the bottom Y. The bottom Y is the X squared minus one, like so. And if we simplify that, we get X, We've got plus one minus minus one, which is a two. So plus two and then minus x squared. Okay, now we need our area function for the quarter circle. Well, the quarter circle would be one fourth of the whole circle and the whole circle would be pi times the radius squared. And the radius in our case is s. Okay, so it's pi over four times x plus two minus x squared squared. That's my area function in terms of x. So the volume is going to be the integral from x equals negative one to x equals two. The pi over four is a constant multiple, so I'm gonna bring that to the outside. And then x plus two minus x squared squared dx. And we can integrate that using our calculator. And I got, well, as a decimal, I got 6.362-ish, and then I divided it by pi on my calculator to see if I could get back to an exact answer, and changed that to a fraction, and I got 81 pi over 40 for an exact value. Critical thinking for this lesson. Explain how to find the volume of a solid with known cross sections in general without memorizing formulas. So think about the process that we went through when we were setting up our integrals. Thanks for joining today. Good luck with these practice problems and I will see you next time.